The static discharge caused a voltage transient that knocked all three fuel cells offline, meaning the spacecraft was being powered entirely from its batteries, which could not supply enough current to meet demand. A second strike at 52 seconds knocked out the 8-ball attitude indicator. The telemetry stream at mission control was garbled, but the Saturn V continued to fly normally. The strikes had not affected the Saturn V instrument unit guidance system, which functioned independently from the CSM. The astronauts unexpectedly had a board red with caution and warning lights, but could not tell exactly what was wrong. The electrical, environmental and consumables manager in mission control, John Aaron, remembered the telemetry failure pattern from an earlier test when a power loss caused a malfunction in the CSM signal conditioning electronics, which converted raw signals from instrumentation to data that could be displayed on mission control's consoles, and knew how to fix it. Aaron made a call, flight, EECOM. Try SCE to AUX, to switch the SCE to a backup power supply. Bean put the fuel cells back online, and the mission continued. Once in Earth parking orbit, the crew carefully checked out their spacecraft before reigniting the SIVB third stage for trans-lunar injection. The lightning strikes caused no serious permanent damage. Initially, it was feared that the lightning strike could have damaged the explosive bolts that opened the command module's parachute compartment. The decision was made not to share this with the astronauts and to continue with the flight plan, since they would die if the parachutes failed to deploy, whether following an Earth orbit abort or upon a return from the Moon, so nothing was to be gained by aborting. The parachutes deployed and functioned normally at the end of the mission. After systems checks in Earth orbit, performed with great care because of the lightning strikes, the trans-lunar injection burn, made with the SIVB, took place at 2 hours 47 minutes and 22 seconds. 80 into the mission, setting Apollo 12 on course for the Moon. An hour and 20 minutes later, the CSM separated from the SIVB, after which Gordon performed the transposition, docking and extracting maneuver to dock with the LM and separate the combined craft from the SIVB, which was then sent on an attempt to reach solar orbit. The stage fired its engines to leave the vicinity of the spacecraft, a change from Apollo 11, where the SM service propulsion system engine was used to distance it from the SIVB. As there were concerns the LM might have been damaged by the lightning strikes, Conrad and Bean entered it on the first day of flight to check its status, earlier than planned. At 30 minutes 52 seconds and 44 milliseconds.36, the only necessary mid-course correction during the translunar coast was made, placing the craft on a hybrid, non-free return trajectory. Previous crewed missions to lunar orbit had taken a free return trajectory, allowing an easy return to Earth if the craft's engines did not fire to enter lunar orbit. Apollo 12 was the first crewed spacecraft to take a hybrid free return trajectory, that would require another burn to return to Earth, but one that could be executed by the LM's descent propulsion system if the SPS failed. The use of a hybrid trajectory allowed more flexibility in mission planning. It for example allowed Apollo 12 to launch in daylight and reach the planned landing spot on schedule. The use of a hybrid trajectory meant that Apollo 12 took 8 hours longer to go from trans-lunar injection to lunar orbit. Apollo 12 entered a lunar orbit of 170.2 by 61.66 nautical miles with an SPS burn of 352.25 seconds at mission time 83 hours 25 minutes and 26 seconds. On the first lunar orbit, there was a television transmission that resulted in good quality video of the lunar surface. On the third lunar orbit, there was another burn to circularize the craft's orbit to 66.1 by 54.59 nautical miles, and on the next revolution, preparations began for the lunar landing. 3. A half hour later there was a burn by the CSM to separate them. The 14.4 second burn by some of the CSM's thrusters meant that the two craft would be 2.2 nautical miles apart when the LM began the burn to move to a lower orbit in preparation for landing on the moon. 9. To move the craft to the lower orbit, from which the 717 second power descent to the lunar surface began at 110, 2038. Conrad had trained to expect a pattern of craters known as the snowman, to be visible when the craft underwent pitchover, with the surveyor crater in its center, but had feared he would see nothing recognizable. He was astonished to see the snowman right where it should be, meaning they were directly on course. He took over manual control, planning to land the LM, as he had in simulations, in an area near the surveyor crater that had been dubbed, Pete's parking lot, but found it rougher than expected. This achieved one objective of the mission, to perform a precision landing near the surveyor craft. The lunar coordinates of the landing site were 3.01239 degrees south latitude, 23.42157 degrees west longitude. 
The landing caused high-velocity sandblasting of the surveyor probe. It was later determined that the sandblasting removed more dust than it delivered onto the surveyor, because the probe was covered by a thin layer that gave it a tan hue as observed by the astronauts, and every portion of the surface exposed to the direct sandblasting was lightened back toward the original white color through the removal of lunar dust. When Conrad, the shortest man of the initial groups of astronauts, stepped onto the lunar surface his first words were, whoopee. Man, that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's a long one for me. This was not an off-the-cuff remark. Conrad had made a 500 United States dollars bet with reporter Oriana Filacci he would say these words, after she had queried whether NASA had instructed Neil Armstrong what to say as he stepped onto the moon. Conrad later said he was never able to collect the money. To improve the quality of television pictures from the moon, a color camera was carried on Apollo 12. When Bean carried the camera to the place near the LM where it was to be set up, he inadvertently pointed it directly into the sun, destroying the secondary electron conduction tube. Television coverage of this mission was thus terminated almost immediately. After raising a US flag on the moon, Conrad and Bean devoted much of the remainder of the first EVA to deploying the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments package. Bean had trouble extracting the RTG's plutonium fuel element from its protective cask, and the astronauts had to resort to the use of a hammer to hit the cask and dislodge the fuel element. Some of the ALSEP packages proved hard to deploy, though the astronauts were successful in all cases. With the PSE able to detect their footprints as they headed back to the LM, the astronauts secured a core tube full of lunar material, and collected other samples. The first EVA lasted 3 hours, 56 minutes and 3 seconds. Four possible geologic traverses had been planned, the variable being where the LM might set down. Conrad had landed it between two of these potential landing points, and during the first EVA and the rest break that followed, scientists in Houston combined two of the traverses into one that Conrad and Bean could follow from their landing point. The resultant traverse resembled a rough circle, and when the astronauts emerged from the LM some 13 hours after ending the first EVA, the first stop was Head Crater, some 100 yards from the LM. There, Bean noticed that Conrad's footprints showed lighter material underneath, indicating the presence of ejecta from Copernicus Crater, 230 miles to the north, something that scientists examining overhead photographs of the site had hoped to find. Samples from Head allowed geologists to date the impact that formed Copernicus according to initial dating, some 810 million years ago. The astronauts proceeded to Bench Crater and Sharp Crater and past Halo Crater before arriving at Surveyor Crater, where the Surveyor 3 probe had landed. Fearing treacherous footing or that the probe might topple on them, they approached Surveyor cautiously, descending into the shallow crater some distance away and then following a contour to reach the craft, but found the footing solid and the probe stable. They collected several pieces of Surveyor, including the television camera, as well as taking rocks that had been studied by television. Conrad and Bean had procured an automatic timer for their Hasselblad cameras, and had brought it with them without telling Mission Control, hoping to take a selfie of the two of them with the probe, but when the time came to use it, could not locate it among the lunar samples they had already placed in their hand tool carrier.